Oh, there we go. <laughs> Look at this. Here's one of them. Hi everyone. Say our video on the 3030 lever action rifle really got a lot of comments and quite a few people mentioned that they, they liked the heritage of the gun that won the West. And then one of our patrons on Patreon mentioned that the this rifle really didn't win the West because it didn't come out until 1894. And by then the West was pretty much won or settled or lost, however you look at it. But uh, this does illustrate the history and the fame of the lever action rifles because this was getting closer to the end of the line for the designs. So what our patron wanted to do was look at some of the older lever actions. How did they all come about? And that's a pretty darn good idea because these were the first repeating rifles. You know, we had our muzzle loaders. First there were flint locks and then there were cap locks and Lewis and Clark were using those. Uh, Civil War was pretty much cap locks, but they were all looking for some way to load rifles faster. All this research was leading up to what we know today as a common cartridge that could shoot in a repeating rifle. So in about 1860, a man named uh, B. Tyler Henry took a primitive lever action rifle known as the Jennings. There was a Hunt and a Jennings and a Volcanic, and they all were gradually evolving to what Henry came out with, which was the first contained cartridge rifle, the way we know them today. Prior to that, they would take powder and put it in the back of a hollow bullet and then ignite that and drive the bullet out, but they couldn't put very much powder in there, so they were pretty weak. But the, the idea was good and they had come up with the tubular magazine already, and that was working out. So all Henry did was he took a brass case, and it was a rim fire, and he called it the 44 Henry flat, and that would push a 200 grain bullet, uh, 44 caliber obviously, about 1,000 feet per second, maybe 1,100 at the most. And now he was on to something, but it was still pretty weak. Well, Oliver Winchester got involved, and he wasn't a gunmaker or a gunsmith or anything, but a businessman. He was selling shirts in New York, but he saw a good idea. And in those days, firearms were a hot item, obviously. And he thought, well, let's get involved in this company. So he invested, and over the years, he bought everybody else out, and he told Henry, he said, look, we need a more robust uh, rifle to do the job here. For one, one of the problems they had with the Henry was it loaded in the magazine tube up here. Well, then you've run the risk of having your muzzle pointing at you while you're doing the loading. It's a lot more convenient to load back here. So he said, come up with some way to load it more easily and get me a cartridge that's more robust and more powerful. Well, what he came up with was the first centerfire cartridge called the 44 Winchester Centerfire. These days it's known as the 4440. It burned 40 grains of black powder. And it was pushing that same 200 grain bullet, but it added about 100 feet per second to it. Well, the rifle was known as the Yellow Boy, and it was the first one that had the loading gate here in the receiver um, and put wood end underneath the barrel. The original Henry didn't have that. You'd be kind of hot, I suspect, if you were shooting a lot with that barrel. And that was a big hit. The Yellow Boy was used a lot. In fact, it was used against, well, I guess it was used in the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And a lot of the uh, Sioux and Cheyenne had those. And uh, man, they made a big difference because our soldiers at the time were shooting single shot trapdoor Springfields. Not exactly a high rate of fire with those. So the Yellow Boy was pretty popular, but still fairly weak. So the next thing Winchester came up with was the 1873, an iron receiver. That made a big difference. You've still got your loading gate back here, but now you've got a stronger rifle all the way around, had a sliding cover on top to keep the dust out of the action. The Cowboys love this one. Slide it into a scabbard on your horse and it rides with you everywhere. Great little option, but still not real powerful. Winchester was looking for more power. The buffalo hunters of the time, the market hunters were all using these big rolling blocks, uh, Remington rifles and Sharps and Ballard single shots with uh, locking up vertical breaches on them and they could hold a lot of pressure. So those were the, the ones that would shoot the buffalo cartridges, the 5110s, the 4590s, 4570s. In 1873, the federal government came out with that 
4570 as the government's official military cartridge. So that made it real popular, just like the 30 out 6 and the 308 later. So guys were looking for lever action repeaters to shoot that. Winchester just wasn't coming up with anything until they discovered John Moses Browning. He popped up with his single shot and Winchester bought that patent and they made the 1885 single shot. We've got a video on that too you might want to check out. But the very next year they came out with the 1886 and this was the heavy duty lever action Winchester had been looking for. How did Browning do it? Well, he put in a pretty nifty system for locking the bolt to contain the pressures of those bigger cartridges. But to show you that, I think we should go outside. And what we'll do is we'll load the 73 and the 86 and 4570, and we'll compare those bullets. We'll do some shooting with them and just go into the details of how these mechanisms work and how I think probably the strongest or one of the strongest lever actions ever made was this one and several designs after this. But this was the one that finally put the lever action repeater into the realm of a big, powerful repeating rifle. The Model 73 was quite weak because it just locked in the battery with a small, small bolt on a toggle system. So you can see there are no locking bars popping up anywhere. It just breaks over here on a little cam. You can feel it when you close it. And that's all that's holding pressures back. And that's why it was pretty weak. Look at the size of the bolt inside right there. That's the breech block. Just that small little bolt. Just not much mass there, or thickness to hold anything. See the big brass lifter that lifts the round up and then the bolt shoves it in. But that's all you've got for locking. Pretty weak. This is the rifle they used to say you could load on Sunday and shoot all week. Now I have a stump down there I want to shoot. Quick to reload, that's for sure. Doesn't do much to the stump though. Oh, it fell over, <laughs> finally. So there are my two holes. <laughs> not, not bad, although I missed one. But look at that, they didn't even come out. Now this is a good hard maple log, so it doesn't surprise me that that little 200 grain bullet didn't come out, but little rifles could be pretty darn accurate. My eyes aren't the best for shooting open sights, but I'm pretty happy with those two. The one that went past there, not so much. Rolling. Here's how this Model 86 worked. This big bar, and there's one on each side of the lever, slides vertically to pop out at the top, and lock and you can see here there's a notch on either side of the bolt with the breech block and it locks up by sliding in there incredibly strong and this is what made the 86 capable of handling the biggest cartridges of the day the 4570 4590 5110 5110 by 450 this was what the repeating rifle market had been looking for. They finally had it in 1886. John Moses Browning. Well, as you could see from the response of that chunk of firewood to that 4440, Winchester was definitely looking for more horsepower. So we're shooting this one in a 4570 with a 300 grain bullet going around 1,880 feet per second, according to the information on the Winchester box. I haven't chronographed it, but that should put out around 2,300 foot-pounds of energy. So this baby's gonna have recoil of all like a 30-06, and we'll just see what it does to that billet of wood down there. Well, didn't blow it to pieces, but it sure knocked it over. Let's go see what it looked like. Well, didn't, uh, not a bad shot, put it right beside the other two, but this one didn't come out either. And again, that doesn't surprise me because I mean, this is a solid chunk of hard, hard maple, but at least it knocked it over. 
And when you're hunting bison, you want some power behind those bullets. Now, this was a black powder rifle. And back in those days, with black powder, you just couldn't get that much velocity. We're shooting smokeless powder now, and that's why we're up at around 1,800, 1,900 feet per second. But back in the day, you were lucky to get 14, perhaps 1,500 feet per second out of those loads. So you're not gonna do much maple hunting with it, but it probably worked for elk, moose, and big bears. But the, even though the bison really weren't around anymore, this was a popular rifle because the West was still being settled with pioneers going pretty deep into the mountains and they were quite a few wolves and especially grizzly bears around yet. And it was always, always a big threat. And it's great round for elk and moose. And up in Alaska, you could use them for caribou up in the North country and just anything big. But gosh, a lot of guys like a 4570 even for whitetails just because they love those big heavy bullets that penetrate so well. And 4570 is kind of the one that's lasted. The 5110 you rarely see anymore. Almost all of the original black powder rounds for this thing are obsolete. But the 4570 still hanging in there. You can get 300 grain bullets, 400, 405 grain bullets, and I think there are even a few 500s. But boy, that puts a wallop on your shoulder as well as your game. 4570 is not a long range option. This is probably a 150 yard gun. A lot like the 3030, only bigger. So elk hunters would like to carry something like this, but a little bit beefy and weighty, eight and a half pounds on this one. If you don't have a scope on it, you can probably get by. You can get shorter barrel models that are a little bit lighter, down around eight pounds, which is not bad at all. And like any lever action, you know, they're slim and easy to carry. They got a nice balance with you right here in front of the action. So it's a great option. This one, I have not shot all that much yet, so it's not as smooth as it will get with more use. But boy, once you slick that baby up, she's going to be fast. Uh, the trigger on this is four and a half pounds, which in a heavy gun like this, I don't find to be bad at all. Yeah, not crazy about that crescent butt, but that's the way they had them in the old days. Guys were tough back then. But I don't feel that the recoil bites much on this. Like I said, it's about like a 30 out 6 shooting 180 grain bullet. A little less than that for the recoil. And if I've got a coat on like this, that didn't hurt at all. I'm not getting bit up in the cheek with it at all either. So all in all, I think it's a pretty nice little option. If you like lever actions and you want something a little stouter with a little more power than the 3030 or the 32 or even the 35, this would be one to consider. Now, shortly after this beefy rifle came out, Marlin, another lever action rifle manufacturer in the day, wanted something that would compete and they came out with the 1895 Marlin and that would also handle the 4570 and some of the bigger cartridges like that. And they've fired that up again and you can now get them. It's one of the most popular rifles out there. It's essentially the uh, 336, but the 336 was an evolution of the 95. So they sell it now in the cowboy look with the with the barrel, with the octagonal barrel on it and all, it's a pretty cool looking gun. I hunted with one in a 4570 a couple of years ago in Africa, and that's quite a treat. So, and then a lot of uh, lever actions are being imported. Petter Soli makes a bunch of them. The Italian firearms group down in Texas imports some beautiful lever action rifles from them. If you want to look at some uh, really ornate ones with some nice wood and, and a lot of uh, case color hardened receivers and stuff like that. You might want to check those guys out too. Hey, before we wrap this up, I think we should go up to the studio and look at some numbers and see the ballistics on this. You might be a little impressed. And also, I think I want to get the splitting mall and uh, see if I can't split that chunk, find out what those bullets look like inside of that maple. See if we can get her done. Well, I see we've got a split in it. Those bullets got me started. So I'm going to see if I can hit that split and Break this guy open, find out what those bullets look like. Oh, there we go. <laughs> look at this. Here's one of them. So there's the hole coming in, and there's the slug. Looks like it only went in about two inches, right into the heartwood. And that looks like the uh, 4570 slug. Yeah, the one that was furthest to the left side. Now let's see if I can find those 44s. Oh, nice, look at this. 
Yeah, that's just a, they're both right there. So this is one of the 44s. See her? I only went in about an inch. And this is the other 4570. I shot twice with that 4570 because I forgot to put the camera on to get the knock over the first time. So I shot it a second time and that's what knocked the log over. But same depth as the other one. Pretty mangled slug. I'll have to get a pliers to dig that out. Oh, there we go. There's the base. There you can see the cantaloupe on the side of it. You can see why the uh, in the cowboy movies they used to jump behind the corrals and whatnot. <laughs> the 44-40s didn't penetrate much. All right, before we continue with the ballistics and the energy levels and the recoil levels of this rifle, I would like to put in a plug for a binocular, the tracked Toric binocular line I am really impressed with. They do dealer direct. They've got all the ingredients you want in a top quality optic these days. The best glass, the best lenses, the best prisms, the best coatings, magnesium barrels. I mean, you name it, they put it in here, but their prices are a little lower than other premium binoculars because they're direct. They don't go through the middleman. So if you're looking for a good binocular at a good price, you might want to check out tracked binoculars. Just look them up online and you'll see they've got all the wonderful bells and whistles we want and a wide variety. I always like an 8X for my general hunting, but if you like to look long and hard, especially on a tripod, you might want to try a big 12 by 50. Tracked, I recommend them. Now let's get back into our 4570. And I think you're going to be a little surprised if you're not already surprised just by watching that chunk of firewood. I mean, most people think of 4570, man, that is massive power. If you can use it on bison, surely you can knock over a little chunk of firewood. But as we saw, I did barely tipped it over. So what exactly is going on? Well, look at the numbers here. We're going to do some comparisons. Now, the first one I want to look at is that 4440. And then you'll see pretty quickly why Winchester wanted to increase their power levels. That 4440 with a 200 grain bullet at about 1,100 feet per second is only generating 444 foot-pounds of energy. <laughs> That's pretty pathetic in this day and age when a lot of people think you ought to have at least 1,000 foot-pounds just for a deer rifle. So... That's not a lot of energy, but then of course you're going to look at the drops, look in that elevation uh, column, and you will see that if we zero for our maximum ordinate, the highest trajectory point at 50 yards, three inches high, you're going to reach out to 100 yards and be just more than three inches low. That's pretty much your maximum point blank range. So it's a 100 yard gun. And at 100 yards, your energy level is cleared onto 336. So really all you're doing is punching about a 44 caliber hole through your animal. And I've taken deer with it and they take the shot and run off and fall over like most deer do when you shoot them through the heart and the lungs. You don't get a lot of dramatic impact. But look down at 300 yards. Not that you're going to be targeting anything that far with a 4440, but look at the drop on that bullet, 158 and a half inches. Now we're going to compare that to the 4570 and see where it starts to really give an advantage. Stay on that 300 yard line and look at the drops now. Only 35 inches. That's huge. Gives you a lot more range. So once again, if we use that three inch peak trajectory, I've got a little bit higher at 3.2 inches at 75 yards. But then it carries out past 175 yards before it drops more than three inches. So you've extended your maximum point blank range pretty darn far. And look at the energy levels. Starting at the muzzle with 2665 foot-pounds of energy, that's a lot more than 444. So you can see why the 4570 was a big deal in its day, and it still is. Now compare that to something we're all familiar with, the 30 6 with a 180 grain bullet. And you see some similarities there. Now the 30 6 will be three inches high at 125 yards, and that carries it out to Oh, it looks like about 270 yards before it's more than three inches low. That really extends your range. And of course, that's what we were looking for with the 30 out 6 and all the modern bottleneck cartridges with smokeless powder. 
But of course we can shoot that 4570 today with smokeless powder and that's how we're getting the velocities we are recording here on these charts. But the similarities in the recoil levels are quite close too. I came up with 27 foot-pounds of recoil energy out of that 300 grain loadie shot out there. As you could see, it didn't rock me much. Why not? Well, that's just about the same as a 30 out 6 shooting a 180 grain bullet if the 30 out 6 were in an 8 pound rifle. This thing, remember, was 8.5 pounds, so there's a little bit of taming going on there. But still, the recoil in that 30 out 6 would be about 23.5 foot pounds at 13.8 feet per second velocity. That's your recoil velocity. So 27 foot pounds to 23.6, you know, they're getting pretty close. So quite similar on that. Now, the impressive thing or the non-impressive thing to me of course is that recoil energy on target it's just not all that impressive and I noticed the same thing when I was hunting with a 4570 over in Africa I shot a warthog that was oh, about a hundred yards away sort of facing so I put the bullet here and it traversed the body and came out just on the hip on this side and I would have thought that that I don't know if the thing was even 80 pounds. It was a pretty small warthog. It was a big old boar, but they just didn't have big bodies. And instead of going plunk, it just took off. I wasn't even sure I'd hit it. But of course, my PH said I did. It was Jeffrey Wayland. And he said, no, no, you hit him. So let's just go pick him up in the grass. And we tracked and tracked. We went more than 100 yards. And when we got there, it was still alive. We had to finish it off. 4570, 300 grain bullet, that just didn't make a lot of sense. Well, later on, I encountered another one, and this took off running, and at about 30 yards, I hit it right behind in the back ribs going forward, and the bullet lodged up in here. And again, didn't knock him over, didn't wobble him, he just kept running. So I put another one in, and that was mostly superficial because he'd angled enough that it just went under and along the ribs and came out. Ran 300 yards and bedded down. We figured he'd be lying there dead. When we got there, it jumped up and ran again. And I took a broadside shot through the shoulders and it still went another 20 yards before it fell over. Never got knocked over. It was like that chunk of wood out there. So where's all the energy? 2000, and um, that's the 30 out six. The uh, 4440, the 4570 has 2,665 foot-pounds of energy, that ought to be able to knock over an 80-pound pig, wouldn't you think? Well, a lot of people told me that I was not using a heavy enough bullet, and it wasn't fair to have that 4570 shoot that 300-grain bullet. You really need a bigger one, so the 400-grain, that's the one. That's going to really knock them for a loop. So I ran some numbers on that. So let's look at those now, mostly the energy column. Holy mackerel, we're up over 3,000. 3,270 feet per second. That's all full, almost a 400 foot-pounds of energy increase. So there's some significant gain from that heavier bullet. The recoil, that's going to hit you a little harder too. 39.2 foot-pounds of energy on your shoulder at 17.23 feet per second. So a little more ouch involved in that one. But hey, you want to be a macho man or woman and shoot the big 4570, that's probably what you want to look for, that bigger, heavier bullet. Now exactly why I mostly see in factory loads these 300 grainers, I'm not real sure. Um, but I think it's because they want to load that stuff down because of some old, old rifles, especially those trapdoor Springfields. I mean, they're still around, and that was a 1873 creation by the federal government. I had one when I was a kid, and they're just not very strong action, so you can't push those velocities up. Um, now, with these modern rifles, once that 86 came out, they were already strong enough to handle more pressure. But again, they were limited by the older rifles. Well, these days, hand-loading guides will tell you what you can do with the new rifles. Most of them will have a 4570 category for older rifles, traditional ones, with really low pressures, about 20,000 cup, that's copper units of pressure, in the chamber. And that's what ends up with those relatively slow velocities. But if you put it in a strong lever action like this or the Marlin, well, now you can crank that baby up over, I think, getting close to 50 copper units of pressure. 
I won't swear to that's the exact right number, but the loads get a lot hotter, and that's what we're looking at here with this 400 grain bullet. This came out of the Spear hand loading manual. It was a uh, flat nosed soft point, and I tell you what, driving that thing at 1900 feet per second in a 400 grain bullet, remember. The one I shot outside was a 300 grain factory load at 1880 feet per second. So, got a lot more velocity going on with this big guy. And you're going to feel it when you shoot, but I wish I would have had some of those loads to shoot into that stump to see what difference it would make. Now, the real macho guys are going to want an even heavier bullet, 500 grains. You don't see that loaded very often in these lever actions, but there's a category for really strong actions, and we'd be talking things like the old falling block sharps and such, I think, in that. The modern version is, is the, Remi, or the Ruger number one. That's that single shot falling block action from Ruger that's really strong. They have a special category in, uh, I think it was in the Hornaday loading manual just for that one. 500 grain bullet, now you're getting pretty long on a 500 grain bullet and that increases your bullets coefficients. So these are some numbers are worth looking at comparing that 400 grain to the 500 grain. First of all, your recoil is jumping from 39 foot pounds on your shoulder to 50.6, 50, 50 foot pounds. I need to shoot that someday. I'm, I'm pretty sure I've shot some that high before, but not in a 4570. A 458 lot would have done the trick for me, but that's a lot of, uh, jolt on the shoulder there and it's coming back at you at 19.58 feet per second velocity so the combination makes for a pretty stout recoil but you're going to gain quite a bit of energy too look at the uh, energy level on that one 3598 that's almost 3600 foot pounds of energy so that's what you're looking for that's what that 500 grain bullet's going to get you but look at the velocity 1800 feet per second well, they're able to get that because they're pushing their pressures up. They can handle it in those single shot Ruger rifles, but probably not this guy. So that gives you an idea of what the potential is of that 4570. Yeah, back in the day, they were using black powder. They had weaker action, so they just couldn't take full advantage of the capacity of that cartridge. Now they can, but you've got to build the right rifle for it. So be careful. If you're just going to pick up a rifle and buy some factory ammunition, you're probably looking down there at that lower levels of energy where you're not doing a heck of a lot more than the 30 out 6 does. Well, that's the story on the uh, Model 1886 Winchester Lever Action and 4570. It's not the whole story, but it's a fair chunk of it. I hope you've learned something and got excited about maybe owning one of these for yourselves. They're a lot of fun. So I want to thank you for watching this video, invite you to subscribe and to check us out at ronspomeroutdoors.com, which is our website. You can find us uh, from time to time on Instagram and Facebook. And we really want to thank our Patreon members for making this possible. And until we meet again in our next video, Ron Spomer wishing all of you a great week and hunt honest and shoot straight. Mm -hmm.